Hi, I'm Lisa Whited, and I uh, delivered, prepared and delivered this webinar a few weeks ago and had enough requests to see it or hear more about it that I am recording it now for sharing. Whoever wants to share, you go for it. This is the time we need to be talking about these things. So I'm just going to get going on this. I don't have any audience at this moment, I'm just wanting to share what's on my mind and hope it's helpful to others at this time. So what could work look like? In the last several weeks, many well-known and well-respected um, organizations have published a lot of information uh, about immediate returns uh, steps to go back to work. Cushman and Wakefield, JLL, McKinsey, Gensler, Newman Knight, Frank, Colliers. I reviewed a lot of this literature and I have summarized it here and I have also provided links to each of these. They've been very generous with sharing their knowledge. So these are articles that have been published, other webinars that you can watch, a lot of detail that I think will be helpful to organizations as they're thinking about their return to work and their immediate steps in returning to work. So what is the immediate impact on the workplace? Here's a summary of what I've learned over the last few weeks. This idea of the six foot bubble or social distance is something that we're going to see for quite a while until a vaccination or widespread contact tracing is in place. So this literally is a design from Cushman and Wakefield where they've put a carpet design uh, to designate what's a safe area. Now the thing about this of course is when you look at space and think about the cost of real estate, it's a a bit astronomical to imagine that there are two people in a space that used to hold six or eight people you can imagine the cost per square foot and then further think about getting to the office if you live in a city and you need to use public transportation how will you get there safely so the idea of a sit literal six foot bubble is what this guy had in mind when he was found walking down the street how will he get into a building entrance into an elevator up to a space and then be in a safe area that's something to think about seriously think about one of the most eye-opening um, documents I read was a blog post by an ar young architect in China who works for Gensler, and he talked about his day in the life, returning back to work, and what he went through. Um, he shared that there were um, there's an app on the phone to indicate if you are a safe green, means you have not been in areas that um, perhaps uh, were more unsafe than others where there was more widespread virus. Yellow is maybe you're on the edge and red was clearly you were in places where there was a lot of virus. So that's an app that they actually have on their phones and they are able to do widespread tracing, contract, contact tracing because they're set up to do that. A typical view of an elevator lobby where you can stand the little red marks on the floor to designate safe places. Many of us have now seen this in uh, supermarkets, for example, on where we can stand safely to be six feet apart from others. And then finally, when he returned home, and by the time you finish reading his typical day, you will be exhausted. He eventually, he eventually said he was so exhausted he couldn't imagine going back into the office the next day. But in his own apartment building, what they had set up in the elevator were little toothpicks that you would take to push the button and then put the um, toothpick in the little jar. So I thought it was a rather clever and ingenious way that they were trying to stay safe in the elevators and thinking about virus passage on buttons. So what we know is heightened sanitization and cleanliness will absolutely be uh, throughout all, all buildings, all spaces, all surfaces. We also know that the capacity of elevators will be greatly reduced. If, if it used to hold 16, now maybe it will hold four. We know that in the actual office space that the distancing will mean that perhaps every other desk uh, will be empty uh, because we need to keep the distance between people. Meeting rooms in a similar fashion, you will see that a room for six now can comfortably hold two and honor the six foot social distance requirement. We also know that the uh, recommendation is for traveling clockwise throughout the office so you don't run into other people. Uh, thermal temperature checks could be going on in some locations where you, even before you enter the building, your temperature is taken. Some will require masks to be worn at all times. Uh, so these are things that will be in place uh, in the immediate return to work. 
So what does that look like on a typical floor plan? This is a small uh, space for only 50 employees, 43 employees actually, but I took a floor plan for a typical 43 person company and then am showing you just for illustrative purposes, essentially the impact of these uh, recommendations on a floor, on a floor plan. So before COVID, this was a 230 square foot per person uh, for 43 people. We will then uh, look at reducing the workstations so people are not facing others and they're six feet apart from them. That reduces the quantity of workstation seats. We also go in and reduce the number of meeting seats, cafe seats, other types of seats, waiting areas, uh, reducing those so people have the required social distancing in place. Even in the bathrooms, looking at bathroom stalls and sinks, Toilet stalls are usually about three feet from toilet to toilet, not counting the ADA toilet. Uh, yeah, there's a partition in between, but still there, there you are closer than six feet and also at the sink. And of course, hand sanitizers throughout, um, even probably more so than when you find in a typical hospital. They are just everywhere and the uh, emphasis on hygiene, cleanliness, um, and potentially masks will be uh, throughout an office space. There's the circulation shown in a clockwise direction. So getting used to a new habit of walking in a certain direction throughout the office space. So what are the impacts on the floor plan? You can see seat changes where we had um, uh, 43, now we're down to 20. Uh, you can see the impact on cafe seats and meeting seats, et cetera. So we then would have a space for 21 people instead of 43, which changes the square footage to 471 square feet per person, uh, more than doubling the square feet per person. So your seat capacities. Before, the plan would hold 155 seats. That includes workstations, that includes um, cafe space, meeting rooms, and then in the immediate after, we go down to 66 total seats. And the square footage per seat will jump from 64 square feet to 150 square feet in the immediate after plan. And then, as I said, the person uh, square footage per person doubles from 230 to 471, more than doubles. So the key findings from the review, again, heightened cleaning and sanitization procedures and protocols. Uh, reviewing the cleaning of air filtration and handling systems is quite a bit that is still emerging on what's effective there, but there are some great people in the marketplace that have in-depth information if you want to learn more about that. Uh, reducing the workstation seats to promote social distancing, same thing in the meeting rooms and cafe spaces. Circulation in a clockwise manner throughout the office so people don't run into each other and uh, potentially thermal uh, temperature checks and wearing masks and possibly gloves also in place, um, people wearing gloves to stay protected. So I, one thing I wanted to just think about though, if we are going back into an office <clears throat> and we are trying to stay safe, many will wear masks. Some will be required to wear masks, others will do it by personal choice. People should be able to do whatever feels safe and reasonable to them. Of course, they need to, to feel safe. But look at these expressions. Um, and I found a woman who does research on this and the two on the right are actually different emotions. But if you don't read facial expressions well, it will take some practice to get used to knowing that surprise and fear may look the same or close in eyes, but, but there are different uh, emotions going on. So uh, I was um, intrigued to find that somebody had found a solution for this. And actually this mask was created for somebody uh, or for hearing impaired folks so they can read lips. Um, so it, it is um, heartening for me to know that innovation is always going, uh, going on around us, which I hope will help our workplaces function better and allow us to be, um, bring our full selves to work. So um, I, if you're watching this video, if you wanna pause it right now, go for it. I'd love you, uh, for you to think, I love you too. <laughs> I love you. And I'd love for you to think about what are the good things that you've experienced while working remotely? So think about that. What are some of the good things going on in your life that you've experienced while working remotely. So if you pause and, and just write down for a minute or so, and then I want you to go to the next question and pause on this one. What are some of the challenges that you've experienced while working remotely? So, th so think about those questions. Um, 
and ponder that a bit because we have heard things all over the Mac from isolation to eating better. Um, some are feeling disconnected, others are feeling more connected. So people are going to feel different, different things are going on in their lives. And those that have had kids at home and are challenged with homeschooling, uh, that is another layer on top of everything else. Although recently I heard somebody say, which I thought was so insightful, you know, our families have been around all along while we've been working. It's just, this has been made more visible. What's going on has been made more visible. Um, and it's a great time to pause and think about that. Think about where do we want to be in our lives, in our work, in our world. Okay, so what was the state of our workplace before COVID-19? Employee engagement has been dismal for a very long time. The Gallup poll has been measuring this probably for close to 20 years. For close to 20 years, only 34%, it's you know wavered a little bit up and down, are engaged in their work. These are the people that really like what they're doing, they get to work and are happy to be there. A huge percentage, 53% are disengaged. They're just you know showing up, uh, checking the boxes, doing what they have to do, but really not excited about the, the work that they're doing. And then 13% are actively disengaged. These are the folks that show up, they're collecting a paycheck from you, but they're on um, monster.com looking for another job. So this really stopped me in my tracks when I learned of this statistic and how unchanged it's been. And this is in the US, worldwide disengagement is at 87%, 87%. So it made me think, we have one life. We spend so much time at work. We spend so much energy working. And to think that people are disengaged and not excited about the work that they're doing is sad. It's abysmal. So this statistic drives me in everything that I do around work, workplace, and people. Over the last several months, I've surveyed about 5,500 people uh, in their workplaces to learn what's working, what's not. And I'm going to share with you some of the highlights of these statistics. This has been work that I've done through the Advanced Workplace Associates Group, which is based in the UK, and there are 50 of us worldwide that do work in the workplace around change management. And so I'm gonna share some of these statistics. These were the top things that people said get in their way of them working effectively when they're working alone. Distraction from people interrupting, distraction from noise, and lack of quiet areas away from distraction. This is what we hear over and over again in the workplace. 53% are complaining of distraction from noise, 45% cannot find quiet places to work, and 48% are annoyed by interruptions. And then when we said, well, hey, what's working uh, or not working when you're um, collaborating with your team members? What gets in the way of you being effective? Here are the top three again. Lack of appropriate meeting spaces, inappropriate mix of meeting room sizes, and lack of appropriate meeting technology. And this was all before COVID. All of these surveys are before COVID. So again, 61% are not finding the right type of meeting space, 55% can't find a meeting space, and 45% it's the technology that's really uh, lacking in this collaboration, this opportunity to collaborate. And then a typical space utilization study. Now this was shared for you know, a smaller organization of 288 workplaces, but it's pretty typical. And what this is showing, it's a study over a two week period, is that the maximum number of workplaces of work seats that were occupied was 63%. The average over that two week period was 48%. And then we looked at it the average without Fridays, because we know Fridays often are a day where people are not in the office. So even average without Friday, it was 50 53% utilized. So that was the amount of time that the spaces were occupied and used. So what that means is that spaces are empty 50 to 60% of the time. It depends on the organization, but we see this over and over and over again. This statistic shows up across many different industries, many different geographies, and many different sized organizations. Does this mean that people aren't working? Of course not. We just know that people are more mobile than they used to. They are in meetings, they're off site. They are still working, but they're not necessarily in an assigned work seat. So in summary, what was the state of the workplace before COVID? We had disengaged people. We had people who are distracted by things going on around them, too much noise and interruptions, 
empty workspaces that aren't utilized effectively, and nowhere to find a quiet, focused place to work. We also know before um, COVID that the average square footage per person, at least in the example I shared with you, was 230 square feet. We often see it, it, it ranges, but in this example I shared with you, it's 230 square feet. It can be lower, it can be higher. All right, so let's pause and think for a minute about the state of our planet. What was the state of our planet before COVID? We knew that there was air quality issues, unhealthy ozone days, global warming going on. We have melting polar caps, air pollution. This was the state of our world before COVID. And, and what has happened during COVID? Yeah, maybe we've seen a few improvements because there's less commuting, uh, less air travel. The air travel is a huge uh, contributor to air emissions, as are office buildings. Commercial office buildings contribute 39% to carbon emissions, 39%, huge impact. We also know that, that our um, choice of travel, mode of travel has a major impact, whether we're a solo driver in a car, we're taking public transportation, um, how we live and how we go about our lives definitely has an impact on climate change. Um, and we know there are many different modes and ways that people can commute to work and uh, are commuting to work or were commuting before COVID. Again, the decrease um, in, in um, pollution, air pollution, because of uh, way less traffic in different cities around the world has been dramatic. It's been a dramatic moment. What are the costs of space operations and productivity. So there's something that's been around for a while, uh, the 33300 rule. This actually is from Jones Lang LaSalle and the numbers might be, it's about probably 2017, I think. So numbers may have increased a little bit. But what we know is that when we look at opportunity for cost savings and we look at maybe utilities and think about green energy, um, the utilities cost $3 a square foot. So if you save 2% on energy efficiency, you're talking about six cents a square foot. We know that buildings cost on average 30, again, depends, it's all over the map in uh, depending on uh, what market you're in, but let's use a number of $30 a square foot. So again, if you're saving 2% on your real estate, you're saving 60 cents a square foot. However, people, the cost of an employee is about $300 a square foot. So if you can gain a 2% improvement in productivity for your people, then you are saving about $6 a square foot. So a major impact when you think about productivity and people, when you're thinking about where can we save money in our workplace. What was the state of our mental health? Again, another uh, headline that grabbed my attention is I heard this a few years ago that the, at the time, our life expectancy in the US had returned to what it was in 1918 when there was a worldwide pandemic and a war. And our um, rates of suicide, drug overdose deaths, uh, just are an, were incredible steep incline. And this was before COVID. This was before COVID. So here during COVID, we know people are having a real challenge getting um, counseling, mental health has taken a hit, substance abuse. There are a lot of challenges right now during COVID uh, in, in thinking about mental health. So are we asking the right question? That's really what I'm pausing. Are we asking the right question? How do we want to work? How do we want to show up and how do we want to work? We need to remember that our work model is based on a very old model from the industrial revolution. And it doesn't need to be that way. It doesn't need to be that way. Think about our planet and our whole selves and how we want to show up. So I've interviewed business leaders. I interviewed them a few weeks ago. It was about six weeks after folks had um, made the exodus to work from home. And these are some of the things they said to me. I don't think people are going to return to the office in the same way as before. Increased flexibility and working will become normal. Going back to an office-based model is feeling suddenly like an old idea. We're more connected now and in better ways than we were before because we're making time to connect company-wide frequently. As a community, we will be much more conscientious about 
things environmentally and as people. I have seen compassion and empathy for colleagues. I hope we hang on to the good stuff. Suddenly, the entire world is my available talent pool. It is liberating. What could our mental health look like? What could it look like? How about being in the World Happiness Report? How about looking at some of these countries and how they're off the charts compared to the United States, which is even on the chart? And what could our planet look like? We know, again, just from this moment in time, really brief moment in time, but how air has um, suddenly gotten much clearer, more clean, uh, the evidence of uh, global air pollution, the evidence of less um, traffic, air travel and commuter traffic has had a major impact. And what could the workplace look like? So I'm asking us to think about what could people and their mental health look like and their spirit? What could our physical environment, um, the world, the planet, the, the globe that we inhabit look like? And yeah, what could the workplace look like? What could, if we are going back to an office, what could it look like? What if we created places where everybody really felt like they could show up as they are, especially right now in the middle of the protests and everything that's going on right now in the United States? Think about that. Think about what we've been doing all these years and what we could do differently. What if people of color could really feel comfortable bringing their whole selves to work? And if you work with colleagues, talk to them. And I guarantee they'll tell you they are not bringing their full self to work. And yes, disabled people, and we know we have the Americans with Disabilities Act, but are we doing enough? I mean, hey, we've got the Civil Rights Act. Clearly that didn't work. And what about trans and LGBTQ people? What can we do to make them feel comfortable in showing up? How about the gentleman in the lower left? He's on the spectrum, Asperger's. What are we doing so he can show up and bring him his full self to work? So what can we do? And I mean, really bring your full self to work, including gender neutral restrooms, which is not unusual. There are companies that have done this, but here's a solution that I thought was brilliant. It's a way to create stalled, um, enclosed places. It's stalled.online slash design. I encourage you to check it out. Yep, we gotta clean these spaces. We know that that's part of something that we need to be thinking about. But if we've got this moment in time to think about the workplace, then what the heck, man? Let's go all in and look at these challenging things that we've got going on and think about what we can do differently. So here's that floor plan I shared. This is the before plan. This is the long-term after plan, and I'll just walk through some of the ideas I'm sharing with you here. So one, how about a meditation and wellness room? And I don't mean just some little room that's also a lactation room and can be used for yoga. I mean, make a full on meditation, prayer room, wellness, and make it wonderful with light and mats and, and welcoming and plants. How about thinking about the meeting spaces that we have and what we could do differently? This is, again, it's a simple room. The room may exist in your workplace already today, but create a spark station. This is a brainstorm room, floor to ceiling whiteboards, floor to ceiling digital screens, stand up work area where people can walk around easily, move the furniture to whatever configuration they want, but really encourage connection, collaboration and brainstorming, not with one dead table in the middle of the room. And then how about a presentation room? We talk about the importance of presentation and now we're doing so much on video screen. So why not take a room and convert it into a full blown movie room? Have a wonderful monitor screen, uh, comfortable chairs. It could be used for client meetings, presentations, pitches. It could be audio, uh, video, 100% video room. It could be used for kids and families coming together for fun moments of connection. Social cohesion is still such an important part. That is one of the things we hear people say they miss is uh, social connection. And so here's a way to remember, you know, I'm connecting with my colleagues, but we all, many of us have families as well. Why not invite them in? And then one of my favorites is something uh, called the campfire room. And this is a collaboration facilitation method, I should say, called the fishbowl discussion. 
I'm guarantee you've got a room like this. You could take, take out the furniture, uh, remove the tables, put the chairs in a circle. And the idea with this type of facilitation method is that the inner circle is where the people are talking and having a conversation. The outer circle are people observing the conversation. And this is especially helpful for contentious or difficult conversations. God knows we could use places like this right now, everywhere. I think the government, imagine what our government would look like if they had spaces like this to talk instead of the very hierarchical uh, set up for most government spaces now, even municipal spaces with the podium at the front and everybody up high and everybody else down low. All right, so what if we also looked at a variety of places, including spaces not in the office? So um, thinking about solo and focus rooms, again, you know, one of the things that people have said, I need a place to go and shut the door and focus and have quiet time. This type of space is for everybody. It would not be, and, and these, again, in many um, companies, they have these spaces, but they need to be 100% for anybody to use any time of the day. Maybe they reserve them for a couple hours a day, uh, but they're used all day long. So it's not just for a senior person who's never in the office anyway, because they're traveling. This is truly a space that anybody can use to go and focus and have heads down work. And then shared library seating. So um, the same idea as we have in libraries, and yes, I do understand the concern at the moment, around hygiene and sanitization, but we also know that these are spaces that can be cleaned. People can bring their own laptop with them, leave with their laptop. I've seen others where they put paper down, just like when you go to the doctor's office for an exam and you sit on the exam table on a piece of paper and then it's torn away for the next person. There are many solutions that can be done that allow you to create spaces where people can show up, they can work, and then they can move on to the next thing that they want to do. And of course, we need to include the home office, which is definitely going to become a regular thing, um, uh, ongoing and even more accepted than it had been previously. And third spaces like coffee shops or even real public libraries. All of these are spaces that people can do their work. So an after plan could look like this. This is all of those rooms that I just showed you put together. Still sure, there would be some regular workstations that are shown in the middle lower part of the plan. There may be some people that come in every single day and that is how they work and that's totally okay. The thing is we gotta support people and how they need to work, however they need to work and each person is different. And there is a way that we can figure out how to communicate, how to collaborate, how to ensure the work is getting done. Uh, doesn't mean everybody has to have a butt in a seat that I can see all day long. So the long-term after plan you'll see uh, is 210 square feet to even up to 100 or down to 100 square feet per person because it depends on what your remote work policy is and how you're going to support people in showing up to work. These are just some other views of these spaces. The lower right kitchen cafe space is going to be even more important because we like to come together around food. It's a social human uh, desire. It's a great thing to do and it should be encouraged. <clears throat> we should have wonderful places to celebrate with each other and also be able to share food. So the impact uh, on space per person in the before plan, it was 230 square feet per person. In the after, it could go down to 100 square feet or less, uh, depending on the remote work policy that's adopted. So in the before plan, we had 155 um, seats. In the immediate after, dealing with immediate COVID concerns and social distancing, we go down to 66. And then in the long-term after, we could go up to 206 seats that are available, that's in the plan that I just shared uh, with you. So the square feet per person, again, the before was 64, I'm sorry, the square feet per seat, before was 64, immediate after was 150, and the long-term after could be 48 square feet per seat. And then the square footage per person, 230 before, 471 in the immediate after, and then the long-term after is 210, and the long-term high remote work after is 100 or even higher. And again, it depends on how you're thinking about your work flex work policy. So what I'm talking about is a way of working that lets us be our authentic selves, is better for the planet, is better for our health, and makes a profit. 
and makes a profit. So what could work look like? Not just the workplace, what could work look like? And so what if instead of, instead of designing the workplace to support work, we design how we work to support our well-being and the planet? We talk about bringing nature into the office and you'll often see plants and living walls, which are beautiful, but instead, why don't we bring our work into nature? The technology is there for us to do it. The planet is there for us to use, to work, to be happy, to be outside. To do this work, it's really important to engage employees in conversations about change. And many employees right now are answering surveys of do you feel comfortable coming back to work or how are you feeling or what's your, what's your um, commute look like if you were to come back to work. I'm not encouraging any more surveys right now. People need to talk to each other. We need to have conversations. We need to let people talk together, small groups, one-on-one. -on -one. So when people can connect with each other, they build community and they have their concerns heard and build trust. And trust is at the foundation of what we're talking about with a new way of working. Leaders show they're willing to listen and build understanding. So this is the change model called the Boston Box that Advanced Workplace Associates uses. And in this model, what we're talking about is making sure there's a rational understanding in place, that people have the data to understand why a change is being made. Why would we change? And there's a lot of data that can be collected and needs to be collected to build that rational understanding. And once we have that, then we need to make sure we're engaging people, the emotional engagement, and bringing them along. And we do that through listening and conversations and connecting. And what we are doing is getting people up to the upper right to be full-blown advocates for that change. But they have to be part of the original conversations. This is essential. And people say that they don't like to, uh, people or other leaders, managers, I'll often hear, no, we don't wanna ask our people because it will um, ex give them unrealistic expectations and we don't wanna manage expectations. Um, people are gonna be resistant. They'll wanna know why we need to change. Resistance is normal. It's a reasonable question. Why do we need to change is a reasonable question. So let's accept it, let's go with it. So the vision conversation is something I became very interested in a few years ago. Actually, uh, I was born with very poor vision and it wasn't until kindergarten when I was in uh, the classroom that the teacher recognized I couldn't see anything on the board. I didn't know, <laughs> I didn't have clear vision. Uh, and this is what my world looked like without glasses. Um, and, and so vision is something I got very interested in. My grandmother showed me that if I made a pinhole with my finger or I looked through the hole of a saltine cracker, then the blurriness would go away and I could see something clearly. Years later, when I was studying strategic planning and learned about um, vision in strategic planning, I recognized that it's the same idea. What visioning and strategic planning does is it allows us to uh, get out the extraneous and just focus on what's essential. So if the vision is fuzzy, then let's clarify the vision. Let's clarify the vision. Vision and mission are all often used interchangeably and there is a difference. Vision is our envisioned impact on the world in the future. It's the why of what we do. It's the why, how the world changes because we were here, because our organization was here, because our company was here. The mission is what we do every day to help us reach the vision. It's the how or the what that we do to get to the vision. And vision is powerful stuff. Uh, this is a quote by Paul Arden, your vision of where or who you want to be is the greatest asset you have. Simon Sinek, who wrote Start With Why, who also has a great TED Talk, I encourage you to look it up, says very few can articulate why they do what they do. By why, I mean your purpose, cause, or belief. Why does your organization exist? Why do you get out of bed every morning? And why should anyone care? So 
in the vision, uh, the vision process, we have people come together. We do this all virtually now um, and have these groups come together and imagine what their impact could be on the world in 20 years. Um, done this with high school students. I've done this with young kids. I've done it with startups, nonprofits, for profits, teams within large companies. And the point is that everybody gets involved in this conversation and they're part of talking. Because often what happens with vision is the top leaders go away to someplace exotic like Hawaii, Hawaii and they have their vision session and they come back and share it or maybe don't share it. Um, and it's, ex it's exclusive. It's not an inclusive process. So people need to get behind a vision and purpose. They want to be connected to something that's bigger than themselves. Purpose is paramount in our work. We know from um, others that have done research that purpose is an intrinsic human motivator. That's Daniel Pink and Drive. For any of us to offer others real choice in something we care about is always a risk. So think about this, because this is part of what I hear is, oh, we don't want others talking about this because I've got my own vision and I don't want others to muck it up. Uh, but what we know also is that real transformation occurs only through choice. So we have got to weigh the desire for holding it close and control and the need to include others so they're part of the conversation and they're part of allowing the transformation to come about. I shared this um, model from Advanced Workplace Associates who have done a ton of research with the Center for Evidence-Based Management. Um, this is the six factors for cognitive or knowledge worker productivity. These need to be in place and the good news is they can be in place in a physical workplace or in remote working. You can create um, uh, environments that support social cohesion, perceived supervisory support, that's my relationship with my manager, information sharing, vision and goal clarity, like what we just talked about, external communications, and trust. Trust is essential. So all six of these need to be in place. There's tremendous research and resources that can support creating these um, at the Advanced Workplace Associates website, and I'll provide links to the white papers there as well. What I'm talking about is a planet at the center. I've heard a lot of people say, we need people at the center of work. I don't think so. I think we need the planet at the center of work. And we, our people, how we connect over food, working at home, brainstorming, collaborating one-on-one, -on -one, bringing our whole selves and our heart to work, exercising, walking, whatever it is, how we do our work, we can do it and put the earth at the center of how we show up and shape work, the work world differently. Thank you for listening. If you made it this far, I appreciate it. Uh, drop me a line. I'd love to hear your thoughts on these ideas and I uh, hope we cross paths soon and everybody is staying safe. Thank you.